Fill your thirst beside the river Wash the journey from your hand Feel the comfort flow inside you Come this far, you understand Hi, welcome to Healing Outside the Box. I'm Rosemary Lachance, a spiritual energy healer, teacher, and therapist. And my co-host can't be with us tonight, Dina, so it will be just myself. Okay, I am the host for this thought-provoking series and are dedicated to providing you with food for thought information and answers to all modalities of alternative healing, spiritual development, animal welfare, environmental concerns, and so much more in the form of guest speakers who are experts in their fields. This series is recorded and will be shown in your area on your local public service cable network. Please contact them for times and dates. If you have a group that you think will be interested in what we have to offer, we're available to come and speak before them and teach. And we'll give you our contact information at the end of the show. Please visit my website, which will give you that information at the end of the show to get more information about everything that we have here. And um, our shows are also available for you to watch on YouTube for free. Just go to YouTube, type in Healing Outside the Box, and make your choices. We are constantly adding new shows, so keep checking back. We're also on Facebook under Healing Outside the Box. Please like our page for the latest information on our show. We hope you enjoy the show. <laughs> okay, um, before we continue and I present the guest that we're having tonight, um, I want to, the sound room is going to put up a, there you go, there's an Operation Animal Freedom Fair coming up in September, but we want to give plenty of notice. We want to let you see this now and know that it's going to be happening. So it's from Rescue 911 is, is who's sponsoring it, and they're looking into contacting, conducting a huge three-day adoption event at North Haven Fairgrounds. It'll be... And I'm sorry, it's going to only be a two-day. That's going to change. It's going to be the 23rd and 24th, 24th and 25th. Now, they've gotten approval from the Fair Association and have the support of North Haven's first selectman, Michael Freedom, Frieda, who is also the co-chairman of Connecticut's Humane Treatment of Animals Task Force. They're looking to work together to this event and try to provide homes for as many animals as possible while promoting any business or organization that caters to animals such as rescues, grooming saloons, pet supplies, pet bakeries, and so forth. They're also looking for vendors to provide only vegan and vegetarian cuisine, skin and hair products that are 100% cruelty free. Basically, if you go above and beyond to keep animals out of your products and food, this is an event for you. Please contact us for more information. And the number is not on that poster, so for Gina, it's 860-510-8640. For Val, North Haven Policeman, is 203-464-8992. Okay, so we have done that, and now... Tonight's show, this is our 193rd show, and the title is Food T Intolerance and Hypertension and Lupus. We talked about food intolerance last at the last show with Dr. Sensenig, and tonight we're going to add hypertension and lupus and finish on the food intolerance. And our guest tonight is the illustrious Dr. James Sensenig. Welcome, Doc. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, Thank it's so you. great to have you here. So much information that you it's have for us. Oh, yeah. yeah. We love him. Um, and we'll give you his contact information at the end of the show. And I'll tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Sensenick has been practicing naturopathic medicine for nearly 40 years and is well known for helping thousands of people regain their health. Dr. Sensenick sees patients with complaints of all kinds and is particularly interested in the treatment of digestive diseases, headaches and migraine, joint and muscle complaints, chronic fatigue. He also sees children with health problems ranging from asthma and eczema to developmental delays and autism. 
Dr. Sensenick graduated from National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon, where he later served as Dean of Education. He was the founding president of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, the chairman of its Government Affairs Committee for a decade, and the founding dean of the College of Naturopathic Medicine at the University of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Dr. Sensenick has consulted for a number of governmental agencies, insurance companies, colleges, and natural products con companies. He is on the faculty of the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Tempe, Arizona, and the Uver University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine. Okay, now to continue from the last show that he was here was less than a month ago. We talked mm -hmm. about the food intolerance. We're going to go on from that. So if you didn't catch that first show, please watch that first show. Very interesting. We're going to go on with the question now um, because we talked about the difference between an allergy, a sensitivity, and intolerance. Now, the question I want to ask you, Doc, is many people eat healthy foods, yet they still deal with weight gain, inflammation, pain, acne, and autoimmune disease. Why would that be happening to them? Boy, that's a really good question. And the answer is relatively broad, I suppose. Uh, let me start with an anecdote. I saw someone okay. I saw someone recently who was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And the orthopedist who the orthopedist who did so wanted to have her start on methotrexate right away. And um, she wasn't sure that she wanted to do that because of the potential side effects of methotrexate. Now, first of all, you got to follow the reasoning here. And for those who don't know who are watching us, methotrexate is used to um, dampen or uh, turn down the immune system. Oh, really? Right? The idea is that in the medical circles, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease, which we'll talk about later. Okay. But when somebody has an autoimmune disease, the, the, the conventional treatment is to use something that will turn off, turn down, dampen the immune response. Mm -hmm. Right. So she was she was told she needed to be on methotrexate for the rest of her life. Oh my God. And so this woman, again, didn't want to do that right away, not as a first order of intervention because she was concerned about the side effects. Anyway, she consulted me and taking a long history, um, and without doing any testing, actually, I suggested to her that she might want to stop eating dairy products and uh, gluten-containing grains. Okay. Within three days, the swelling in her knees was gone wow. for the first time in years and has never returned. And the reason I'm telling this story is when I saw her again in the office, the first thing she said is, who knew? And I said, who knew what? And she said, who knew foods could have that kind of effect on you? Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is, everything that you put in your body affects you, for yeah. better or for ill. Right. And it's not that it's simply neutral. I mean, the idea that you can eat anything you want and it doesn't do anything to you is absurd. I mean, can you name one cell or one function in the human body that doesn't depend on what we put in our mouth? Mm. I mean. That's what we eat for, That's right? right? So depending on what those foods are, they have different effects on different people under different circumstances. You can't have categorical, um, you know, simple answers. Is gluten bad for you? Well, for some people. Is milk bad for you? For some people. It depends on the situation. There are many ways in which our bodies can react to the foods. The classical way is to have an intolerance, which we talked about on the last show. Mm -hmm. Things like a lactose intolerance, right. for example or other foods that cannot be digested properly. So we're intolerant to it, and it produces symptoms, usually digestive symptoms. Or you can be allergic to something. There are at least two ways in which you can be allergic, which involve two different parts of our immune system. You can react immediately. That's the classical, you know, you eat the strawberries and your face breaks out kind right, of thing. Right. Or you can have what's called a delayed hypersensitivity reaction, which is a completely different category of reaction, where the symptoms don't come on sometimes for days. Mm -hmm. Then you can have the effect of the food that is directly changing what's going on in your gut. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of different species of bacteria that live in our digestive tract, and they are, they eat something, right? Mm -hmm. 
And among the things that they eat are what we eat. So our food affects what's going on in the so-called biome. And certain foods, or certain microbes, I mean, are increased or decreased by certain foods. So for example, some carbohydrates will feed certain species of yeast or mold or fungi that are living in our gut, and that'll produce a different problem. So there's many, many different ways to react. There are tests that can be done, and we won't go into any detail on that, that can help identify those depending on the symptoms that somebody has. But perhaps one of the best ways is if you don't feel well, pay attention to what you're eating. And right. I had somebody just tell me today that after eating a handful of mixed nuts, like a party mm -hmm. mix kind of thing, she felt lousy. Well, huh, well then why do you keep eating them? Right. Right? I mean, Pay attention to what you're eating, and if it seems to have an adverse effect, you don't feel quite right, you get a headache, you get bloated, whatever, then stop eating that. Maybe seek, you know, seek some advice from somebody who can help you uh, narrow that down or do something about it, but there are many, many different ways in which foods have a deleterious effect. And this is also, we talked about this last time, that's a whole other discussion, we go on about hours, but the food ain't what it used to be. It simply isn't what it used to be. It is completely, not completely, but very much demineralized. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the vitality that it used to have. I had somebody make a comment to me, just, I'm trying to think who it was, a man who's about 70 years old made a comment about, just on this subject, he said, you know, food doesn't look like, smell like, or taste like what it used to 50 years ago. Right. I don't know, he says, what happened? So he's talking about, you know, obviously the stuff in the boxes and the cans is processed. But people are eating fresh food that they're buying from reputable places that's organic and, mm. and untreated with chemicals and other mm -hmm. things. Yeah. It's still not still, as vital no. or as robustly uh, nutri nutrient dense as it was, say, 50 years ago. That's why I tell people you have to take vitamins today because it's not in the food anymore. Well, that's why they're called supplements. Right because they're supplementing what right. you're supposed to get. Exactly. You know, there was a study done um, by the Congress uh, some years ago where they found that the mineral deficiencies in the soil in the United States, the agricultural soil in the United States, is so mineral deficient that, um, qu I'm more or less quoting, although I don't, know, get, I don't know if I'm getting it exactly right, they said the man of today cannot eat enough food to supply the minerals that he needs because his stomach isn't big enough, meaning that the food is so demineralized, right. right? And they went on to say in this report that unless something is done about the demineralization of our food, this will constitute a medical emergency or a medical catastrophe and mm -hmm. it will bankrupt the nation. Mm -hmm. That was in 1934. Wow. Nice Senate document 264, I think. Wow. 1934, 1935. Nothing's been done. No, it hasn't. So, we're not, so the point is that foods can affect us in many ways because, in part, they themselves, the foods themselves, have changed and been manipulated. Yeah. Like I, I like we say, okay, good whole wheat, organic whole wheat is good for you. Organic soy only is pretty good for you, not as a great food anymore. Um, and yet I am allergic to I any form, organic, no matter how great it is, I still have the allergy. And the soy the same way, I still have the, the problem with that. So yet, like we're saying, they're healthy, but not necessarily good for you because you have certain allergies. But also, I also read where they're putting more gluten into the wheat. It used to be like 13%, now it's almost 50%. Right, it's been. I don't know why they're been, doing uh, that. It's been hybridized. Well, yeah. because what gluten uh, gluten uh, gluten makes makes food taste yummier. Yeah, rises and, better. And it rises better. You get a better loaf of bread, or you get a better pizza crust, or whatever, and that's what consumers want. So, that's what they're getting. And the world is made up of wheat and soy. Well, but you everything, know everything everywhere you go, it's wheat and soy. You know, you know, one of the things that I find is interesting is though that this problem is an American problem. It's not. A, it's not a universal problem. Right. I have patients, and I've seen this over and over again, where someone, we can test objectively that they're reacting to a certain food. And without getting into details, let's just say that person gives up, let's make it wheat for sake of discussion. Mm -hmm. They give up wheat and their health improves, they no longer have digestive symptoms or whatever it was that they had. It doesn't always have to be digestive, by the way. It can be joint aches, joint pains, migraines, right. skin problems. ADD, you know, ADHD, ADD yeah. it can be all kinds of things because 
when you disturb the biochemistry of the body, it's not going to just affect one thing. It can affect anything. You might say it's going to affect the weak link in the chain, right? But in any case, you take somebody who fits that example where they where we can show that they're objectively reacting to gluten, they give up gluten-containing grains, their symptoms improve, they live happily ever after, and then they go overseas. And they go overseas, and I actually had somebody like this a few years ago, who uh, in Italy for a junior year abroad uh, told me when she came back, she said, I got there and I'm, I said to myself, I, there's no way I'm going to avoid wheat. I mean, all this pastry and right. pasta and yeah so she cautiously starts eating wheat in Italy no problem on returning to the United States and continuing to consume wheat because she assumed that there was no problem now she got sick again I've seen the same thing with children who have a response to milk in the United States they stop the milk and their problem their chronic problem clears up and then they go overseas and they're able to tolerate milk in other countries so it's a combination of the you know in a nutshell it's, the, it's a combination of the chronic, the rise in chronic illness amongst the U.S. population and our decreased vitality, our decreased ability to function normally and correct these deficiencies and imbalances in the body on the one hand and then the manipulation of our food supply on the other. You know, okay, we're going to end this shortly and move on to the other two subjects, but you know, I want to say, which I'm sure people are going to ask this question, what can people do about the fact that they are growing our food without letting the ground rest, without the minerals, without the vitamins? Without, can people just start, com I mean, they have all these marches on Washington for all this junk stuff. Could I wonder if we could do anything to change that. Well, I, personally, I'm kind of jaded about those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I don't see big fill-in-the-blank big farm, big food, big tobacco, big... I don't see them changing. No, I don't either. Like that I don't because of protests. Right. But what does change is the pocketbook. Right. I read in a, in a magazine, not to be named, that I found in a waiting room somewhere that the American food, the big guys, the big food yeah. companies, we won't name names, but everybody knows who they are, lost $400 billion in a recent fiscal year because people are turning to other foods. When yeah. people start reading labels and they start buying better, when they want things that are locally grown, when they don't want additives and colors and GMO and all this other stuff in their food, it doesn't seem like a big deal if you decide that you're not gonna buy from the big guys who are tainting the food mm -hmm. and you're gonna buy locally, but you start adding that up, it turned into $400 billion, so guess what? Those companies are starting to produce, and you see it everywhere in the supermarkets, they're starting to produce foods that are more healthy, right. or healthful, I should say, they, because they're following the consumer lead. And so I think that the adage that, you know, they all, you know uh, act globally, but, you know, uh, buy locally or whatever that mm -hmm. is, it, it's really true. I mean, every person who changes their eating habits or their buying habits is one more drop in the bucket that's changing the, it's a political act. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like it might, not, it might not be, but when you stop buying foods that you don't want to eat because of what's in there, you're, you're making a political statement. And when, you know, 50 million people make that statement, it changes what we get. Okay, well. And witness, and, excuse me, witness the fact that in the last decade or two, you can walk into any super, at least here in Connecticut, you can walk into any supermarket chain and you can find a natural food section. Right. You're right. Okay. Absolutely. And you can find organic food, too. And they wouldn't yep. be doing that if That's right. they weren't. Right. So, people, I want to tell you out there, you know that thing, we the people, we the people have people power, people power. We can make the changes just by doing that. It doesn't have to be any big deal just by doing that. So let's keep up doing this so we can have the changes and get the healthy food, right? Okay. Well, you don't have any choice. If you want to be healthy, you can't restore your health or regain your health without putting the nutrients that the body needs into the system to make those corrections. Mm -hmm. And you must avoid, at all costs, 
literally, you must avoid putting the toxins and the poisons in your system right. because you're getting enough of it elsewhere. That's right. Why would you want to eat it as well? And they, they tell you, if you read it anywhere, that wheat, corn, and soy is all GMO now, unless it's organic. And even then, you can't tell for sure. But GMO, you don't know what is in there, what is affecting. And they soak these seeds in pesticides before they plant them so that they don't have to work so hard with the bug spray. And you are digesting them. And doesn't that turn to heavy metals in the organs, right? That's what happens when you eat the pesticides. So... Well, we're certainly, it's, it's, there's two sides to being healthy. You have to give the body what it needs to function properly, mm -hmm. and you have to remove the waste. All biological functions have waste. Every cell has metabolic waste, and normally that's flushed out of the body through the liver, and of course the bowels, and even through your breath, and your sweat, and so on. So there's, the, the, there's what you put in, but you also have to get rid of the toxins. We're living at a time when the toxic load is phenomenally high, mm -hmm. and it's enough in the air and the water and mm -hmm. elsewhere. Why would you want to eat the stuff? Right, exactly, exactly. So it's up to you people. We've taught you, told you, tried to help you. Now you take this ball in your own hands and run with it. All right, so we're going to move on to the next thing. We're going to talk about hypertension, which is high blood pressure. What do you feel are the causes and the cures? We'll start with the causes. Well, let's start with what high blood pressure is. What is, yep. Okay. So when your heart contracts, it's pushing the blood through the, through the circulatory system. Mm -hmm. And there's two sides to the heart, left and right side. And the, the, you're pumping, one side is pumping through the body, pumping the blood through the body. And the other side is pumping the blood through the lungs. So the blood is pumped through the body and then it comes back and it goes through the heart and it goes to the lungs where the CO2 is let go, the, the carbon dioxide is let go, and more oxygen is picked up by the blood, by the red blood cells, and then the red blood cells deliver that to the periphery and so on and so forth. So every time the heart contracts and relaxes, you can imagine it has an effect on the vessels, which have a certain elasticity to it because mm -hmm. there's a, you know, there's a, a pressure Pulse, pulse, yeah, which is you know the pumping and then the relaxing and the pumping and the relaxing, and so that's known as the systole or the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. So every time the heart pumps, you're getting some pressure in the. It's a hydraulic system, so you're getting pressure in the system, and then you're getting relaxation, or at least you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that pressure can be higher than what it should be. One of them is a problem with the arteries themselves. If they start getting hard, hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, right? Now, now it's like if I use a hydraulic uh, analogy, the pipes are not pipes, but they're tubes that expand and move. Well, if they can't move or they can't respond to the pressure, then the pressure is going to go up because the pipes are not, mm -hmm. you know, are not movable enough. The other thing is if you have more fluid in the system, you put more fluid than the system's designed to carry, right, then obviously you're going to have increased pressure as well. But also, probably the main cause, I think, speaking as a naturopathic doctor, is good old-fashioned stress. Stress, you know? that's what I, yes. Okay, when we're stressed, right. our heart's pumping a little more vigorously and a little harder and a little more rapidly, and so that's going to increase the pressure as well. Mm -hmm. I totally the, agree. The opposite is true. When you're relaxed, when you're mellow, when you're in your sort of meditative state, right. your pressure is low. In fact, conventional medicine has actually discovered in the last couple of years that one of the best things you can do for blood pressure and heart disease is, guess what? Relax. Stress management. Right? Right. So, not wanting to be facetious, you figure how we live these days in our culture, it's no wonder mm -hmm. we have high blood pressure. Just from the stress factor. That's right. But then you add, now we're back to food choices and those things that are causing the hardening of the arteries, so to speak, um, and some of the other foods and liquids, sugary liquids and so on that have and salty things that help us or require the body to hold more fluid. Mm -hmm. But mostly I would say it's stress. It's stress. I mean you can see this in a very practical way amongst someone or with someone. 
you, you know, if you come rushing into my office right off the interstate and you're late for your appointment and we take you in and we take your blood pressure, it's going to be whatever. Mm -hmm. If you sit there for five or ten minutes or half an hour and you just relax and we right. take your pressure again, it's going to be different. They do that a lot. They right? do that a lot, yeah. Take it once you, yeah, when you get or there. Or the old white, so-called white coat syndrome. Yes, when you we know? see a doctor. But this I means know. that you see the doctor or you see the white coat, your pressure is higher than it might be if you took your pressure at a supermarket uh, uh, station for blood pressure mm -hmm. or at the, or at the, at the at a health fair, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere. Because why? You're relaxed or you're under stress. I mean, that should be proof enough right there that stress is, mm -hmm. stress is important. Okay. Now, when you take that problem to a doctor, they give you pills. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what do these pills that they give you do to your body? Well, it depends on the, it depends on the pills because they act in different ways. Okay. Some Maybe a few them, examples. Some yeah. of them slow your heart. Some of them increase the amount of fluid that your kidneys are dumping. How does it, how does it do that? Do you know? Well, that's a, that's a really good point. You know, if I were a pharmacist, I would tell you all the nitty-gritty about how that does that. Yeah. But you bring, you bring up a point that every naturopathic doctor should know, and probably every doctor of all kinds should know, and the public should know. You raise a really good question. Like, when you take a drug for something, how does it know to go to your heart? Mm -hmm. Or how does it know to go to your kidneys? Mm -hmm. Or how does it know to go to your joints? And the answer is, it doesn't. The drug affects the whole body. Mm. The drug, by its very design, is toxic. But the toxic effect on the system is different, it's greater or lesser in different organs or systems. And allopathic medicine, or conventional medicine, is concerned with the primary toxicity, the primary effect. So we give you this drug to slow down your heart. It has other effects because it affects the whole body. And we just write those off, not we, but they the do. industry the doctors, yeah. just writes those off as side effects. Side effects. Right? So you need to put up with the side effects in order to get the primary effect of the medication. And okay. it really shouldn't be called a medication in my book because it's really not medicine. Right. You know, it's, it's actually toxic. And now I'm, uh, now I'm going to get a little, I'm going to get in trouble here because I'm getting political about this. But this is why we have pharmacists, to keep you from croaking from your medicine, right? You have a whole class of people whose job it is to make sure that what the doctor prescribed is not too much that you're going to get a problem or get killed, right? And I'm not trying to be funny, no. right? Because the purpose of conventional medicine is to stop the symptoms to intervene. The body's doing something. It's responding. Take the high blood pressure we're talking about. When you have high blood pressure, you have it for, there's a reason that the pressure's going up. Right. So conventional medicine is giving you a chemical, a medication that's designed to stop that by one of these mechanisms that I talked about by relaxing the arteries, by st slowing down the heart, decreasing the pressure on the system, eliminating water or fluid so there's less in the system, and so on and so forth. Never asking the question, why, is this person have, why does this person have high blood pressure? Mm, right, right, exactly, yeah, right? exactly. So, and why we have high blood pressure is maybe if you have high blood pressure and I have high blood pressure, we have them for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Now. It could be said, and I'm sure there are people listening who would say, well, isn't there a time when it's so high that you have to get it down because it's life-threatening? And the answer is yes. But taking a medication long-term to do that isn't solving the problem. No. Right? Just a Band-Aid. That's it. And you know, something else that people have experienced, especially with hypertension and other problems, is you get to a point where that doesn't work anymore. Now you have to take more. Right. Well, the reason you have to take more I mean, you know, where's the critical thinking here? When, when somebody says to you, this isn't working like it was, I need to give you a different drug or a do another one or a higher dose. What's really happening here from, a, from the point of view of a principle is that the intervention is designed to stop the symptom. Right. In our world, in naturopathic medicine, we call that suppressing. 
We're suppressing the symptom. The body's reacting in a certain way for a reason. We suppress the symptom. Well, the suppression isn't going to work forever because the body's going to continue to, to display that symptom. Yeah. So now you need stronger and stronger medicine more and more often because the suppression isn't working. Thereby goes the harm to your body. It gets worse and worse. Oliver Wendell Holmes said in 1900, as the, as the medicines get stronger and stronger, people will get sicker and sicker because he understood this principle. Exactly. And that's where we are today. More and more medication for more and more things. I mean, you've all seen the ads for, there's a pill for every ill. Right. And if it's not working, add this one or take another. Yeah, exactly. So back to hypertension. Uh, you would be told in conventional medicine with, you know, with, uh, with arteriosclerosis that there's nothing you can do. Well, I guess there is something you can do. They would tell you that if you lower your cholesterol, that will, yeah, that will help to do that. that we had but, to... but there are many different ways, in, and some of them go back to our discussion about food sensitivities, supplementation. Basically, normalizing the function in the body allows the atherosclerosis to slowly begin to to reverse itself and there are ma and there are many supplements that will help to relax the arteries and return that normal elasticity to it and um, there are ways to increase or normalize kidney function as well um, so there are ways to to when you return body when you return the body to normal function you don't have the you don't have the symptom. But then they take it on the rest of their life. They take these pills the rest, rest of their life. And here's a complaint that I'm going to address with you because it's been told to me by many women and some men that the high blood pressure medicine causes impotence mm -hmm. in men. Okay? Can you explain why that would happen? Well, yeah. Okay. I mean, it seems obvious, and I hope we don't get too weird for TV here, yeah. but a, an erection requires blood pressure. That, uh, an, an erection it occurs when the penis is filled with blood. Right. Right? Now there are certain circumstances and what I want to say, um, um, stimuli that allow that to happen. Right. But it's basically a filling of this tube with a high pressure liquid, which is the blood. Right. Well, if you're turning down the pressure, then it's that, not getting, it, getting it, there. You can't happen. Right? Okay. So, so, these men that have this problem should really seek other ways to get their mm -hmm. body back in shape, or or right. not enjoy what well, they like anymore. Well, there's something else that just came to mind as I as I said that too. The other thing that's been shown with penograms, which are the equivalent of the mammogram. You know, where you look at yeah. the, when you look at the actual tissue and the blood flow, what happens in men with erectile dysfunction, not all, but sometimes, is it's not just that there's not enough pressure, but there's not enough flow. There's not, there's not enough, the same thing with the arteriosclerosis. There's arteriosclerosis in the veins of the, oh, of the, the penis. Oh, they get, yeah, they get, right? yeah. So you can't get enough blood to create the erection in the first place, right? right? So not only do these medications make that problem worse, but the underlying problem that's leading to the need for the medication in the first place is not only occurring in the peripheral veins, but it's also occurring in the penis. So reversing the atherosclerosis or the hardening of the arteries benefits the whole system. Right. So it all boils back down to that. I mean, I know there's a lot of problems with that, you know, and uh, there men out there are going to have to seek other measures to help yourself. And like Doc well, said, the the natural ways to cure yourself so you can get off these pills and start enjoying life again. And uh, the proper foods, proper supplements, the proper mental attitude, well, right? All that. Well, you see... You know, someone who thinks about this from a different point of view, like a different philosophical understanding of what illness is, and therefore a different way of intervening. See, a little editorial here. Some people think, thanks to some of these TV doctors, that what natural medicine is all about, or at least what naturopathy is all about, is using 
naturally occurring stuff in place of a drug. Mm -hmm. You know, what can I take instead right. of my steroids? What can I take instead of my inhaler? Well, that's still treating the symptom. Right. Now you're just treating it with something that's less toxic, but maybe not quite as effective. The question is not what can I take instead of my blood pressure medication or what can I take instead of my steroid or what can I take. The question is why do you have the problem in the first place? Exactly. Because the problem is a manifestation of something else and you've exactly. got to treat to something else. Exactly. And when you treat something from the conventional point of view, when you're treating the symptom, when the medicine is directed at the symptom, you will always have side effects mm -hmm. because of what I just said before. The stuff, the medication, the whatever you want to call it, the chemical that's put in the system to treat the symptom is also going to affect the rest of the body. And again, that's dismissed as side effects. Right. And you actually hit the nail on the head there with what you said about the problem with erectile dysfunction because that's the classical example that's used when we're teaching this kind of stuff, which is when you take any kind of medication in a conventional world, you are always, 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 always trading off something for something else. Mm -hmm. You're getting, you, 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 every, you will hear people say in conventional medicine, every drug has a side effect. But what they really mean is every drug used in that manner, every drug used allopathically conventionally has a side effect because they're using it to target a symptom. Exactly. And therefore, that chemical, which is having other effects, produces other symptoms, again, dismissed as side effects. So whether you're taking a cholesterol medication or something for hypertension or something for erectile dysfunction or something for your back pain, you always will have another symptom. And you are either consciously or otherwise being asked to accept the new symptom in place of the old one. Exactly. Right? There's a trade-off. You know, you can take this stuff for your cholesterol, but it might cause a liver problem. Yeah, which I we've had a show on that. It's right, you can take this, but it's going to cause this. So the old joke is the one you just made, you know. Mr. Smith, I'm really sorry about the erectile dysfunction, but at least your blood pressure is normal. Right. Right? And, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny about that. I mean, that's, that's, exactly, mm -hmm. that's exactly what's going on. And by the way, that's what allopathic medicine means. It's from the Greek, which means the other suffering, or another aloe, other disease, other uh -huh. suffering. Allopathic medicine, dictionary definition of allopathic medicine is the curing of one morbid condition by replacing it with another. With another. Uh, very good. So here, exactly. take this, I got rid of your hypertension, but now you have now erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Now you go to the next person, <laughs> yeah. Who's going to treat that? that and, then right. you get, and there you go. And you're going to get these other pills for that. And I don't know. You know, people take, they must have, some people take upward of 10 pills a day. One of them is for the original condition, mm -hmm. all the rest are for the symptoms of each mm -hmm. pill that they take. And then what happens? They eventually die from all this medication. You have to put well, a stop to this. You have to get a natural way to heal yourself. You and I have had this conversation before, I think. Americans constitute 5% of the world's population mm -hmm. and consume, I'm going to use that word consciously, consume half of the drugs that are manufactured in the world. Yeah. Right? There's no other country that takes, I mean, if we're eating half the drugs in the world, that leaves the other half for the rest of the world. So mm -hmm. nobody else comes close. Right. Right? And somebody might be thinking, well, yeah, but we're so healthy. Uh-uh. According to the World Health Organization, we're the 91st most healthful nation. It's terrible. All right. Well, there you have it on the hypertension, the high blood pressure, and... Uh, oh, can we... I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh -huh. The other thing that I find interesting is in the time that I've been in practice, which has gone on 100 years now, um, the numbers keep changing. The numbers that are acceptable keep changing. So if this is really a science, conventional medicine, mm -hmm. how come the numbers keep changing? Mm -hmm. You know, it's for many, many, many years, it's been thought that the blood pressure has to be very close to what's called normal, 120 over 80. Then the guidelines change, and they say, well, you know, you don't really need to treat somebody, 
you know, after 130 over 85, that's acceptable. Now the newest guidelines, which came out, I think, in 2000, I'm not a cardiologist, but I think came out in 2013 or 14, is there's no need to treat anybody who's at 150 over 90, right? Oh. Because there's no, because there's no benefit, there's no, there's no, uh, uh, in long-term studies, there's no perceived benefit to giving somebody medication when their blood pressure is still at 150 over 90. So why is a, why is a doctor giving you the medications in the first place? Mm -hmm. Is he treating you or is he treating the numbers? Right. I don't know. I don't know. It's just now, it must be said that we, we, we can't be, we can't be, um, uh, stupid here. There's a time when high blood pressure can be a dangerous situation. Right, right. Because if you have higher pressure in the system, there's a problem or a potential problem with it rupturing, right? right? With the pipes bursting, right. right? That's known as a stroke, right? Or there's a potential problem with, if, I, if I'm mechanical about this, there's a potential problem that the pump's going to give up. Right? right, or the pump's going to be straining too hard. This is what we call heart disease and congestive heart failure, and so on. Yeah, and so forth. these things can happen. So it's not totally something agreed. to ignore. No, no. But but the, but the answer, from a naturopathic point of view, is not more medication. Right. Change your diet. Change your lifestyle. Change your attitude. Change all that, and have a happier life. All right. So now the last subject we want to talk about. We got about less than fifteen minutes. Uh, and people have been asking me about this, lupus. Lupus has been cropping up with a lot of people lately. I've been hearing more and more about lupus. And um, I don't, it, it's an autoimmune disease, right? And it was, it was so rare, but now so many people seem to have it. Do you, do you know what it is? What happened? Why? Hmm? Why? Okay. If you look at this from a naturopathic point of view, right. then, now we get back to the sort of philosophical side. I'm going to suggest that when I was in naturopathic medical school, way back when, we learned about autoimmune diseases because we sort of had to. We had to know what they were, but they were rare. Now they're everywhere. Everybody's got an autoimmune disease, ranging from lupus to MS to Hashimoto's thyroiditis and on and on and on. Lupus is in a category sort of by itself. It's a situation where what's happening on the cell or on a physiological level is the body is making the antibody, the, the immune system is making antibodies to the nucleus of the cell. So they have anti nuclear antibodies. In fact, that's one of the most common, if not the most common test that's done to see if the ANA, the anti nuclear antibody level, is high because this tells us then that the immune system is reacting against the cells. Mm. So an autoimmune disease is a disease where it's just kind of what it sounds like. An autoimmune means that your own immune system is attacking your tissues. Yeah. yeah. If, it's, if you're attacking your thyroid, it's autoimmune thyroiditis. If you're attacking another organ, it's autoimmune pancreatitis or you know whatever mm. it happens to be. Um, if it's attacking your joints, it's thought to be arthritis and so on and so forth. But what's happening here is the immune system is attacking a normal tissue. And of course, then that has consequences, right? It's really interesting to me <clears throat> that in the almost 40 years I've been practicing now, that the level or the rate of autoimmune disease is through the roof. Yeah. Right? Right. And before I get into that, let's talk about lupus. In the case of lupus, the antibodies seem to be widespread and and lupus is, is I think in some circles it's thought of as the like, great imitator. It looks like so many other things because it presents in a way where the symptoms are related to whatever is being attacked. So that can be muscles or joints, it can be mucous membranes, it can be the mouth, it can be um, the skin and so on. So depending on what organs involved you're going to have different symptoms of course. Lupus takes its name, lupus erythematosus takes its name from, well, I guess we don't know, but there's classically people tend to develop a rash, what's called a malar rash on the face uh -huh. that looks like a butterfly rash. Some uh -huh. people call it the butterfly rash. And there are those who have said that it has the name lupus because 
it reminds one of the pattern of fur that you might see on a wolf's face. Lupus means wolf. It's right, Latin lupus wolf. is wolf, yes. So some people say that's where it got its name. It's also been said that it used to be thought that the disease was from the bite of a wolf. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> We're wolf. But anyway, <laughs> it's a reaction where the antibodies, again, are uh, affecting the, the uh, nucleus of the cells and can involve most, most tissues. But all of the autoimmune diseases are on the rise. Now, in conventional medicine, and you can Google this anywhere and learn about this for yourself, in conventional medicine, the explanation is that the immune system is attacking the body, the body's normal tissue. And then the next part is the difficult part for a naturopathic doctor to understand, because you then therefore assume that the immune system is out of control. The immune system doesn't know what it's doing. And that's why the treatment for autoimmune diseases is always to an anti-immune intervention. You're doing something to, as I said earlier, dampen the immune system or turn off the immune system right, or, right, or actually yeah. destroy the immune system. Right. right? And it can't be good. No. But from a naturopathic doctor's point of view, it's exactly the opposite. See, this is a little philosophical aside. You know, the way you see the world, the paradigm, the, 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 the worldview, the framework in which you see something is the container for the information that you have. Information is not self-interpreting. Mm. You know, if you have a fever, we can agree that we have a fever. A fever is a fever is a fever. But what does that mean? Well, in some circles, having a fever is a bad thing, and we've got to turn that off. But in other circles, in naturopathic circles, the fever is a good thing. It's the body's response, and it needs to be assisted. It's there for a reason, right? Well, the same goes with the autoimmune interpretation. We can all agree that the immune system is attacking the tissue, but assuming that that's because the immune system is overactive and out of control. See, we live in a, we live in a universe of order and intelligence, right, and purpose. So why would your immune system just start attacking right, right. And in the paradigm or the framework or the way that I've learned to understand disease is when the immune system is attacking you, it's because the immune system itself is confused, if I can use that term. Right, yeah, that's a good it's one. It's not healthy. Right. It can't think clearly. Just like when you're tired or sleep deprived or for that matter inebriated, you can't, you can't think clearly. Right. And when your immune system is tired and worn out, it can't think clearly. So now it confuses its normal tissue with abnormal and so on and so forth. So the approach to an autoimmune, uh, understanding an autoimmune reaction in the naturopathic or the vitalist world or paradigm is to understand that the individual is probably in a situation where the immune system is, for lack of a better word, compromised because they're so tired or unhealthy or stressed out. Right. And my clinical experience would bear that out. You see somebody with an autoimmune disease, they're not coming to you in robust good health where their immune system is having a, you know, an overreaction. It's quite the opposite. They've had a long history of stress at work or, you know, personal personal stress in a relationship. They haven't been healthy for a long time, whatever. And then they're diagnosed with lupus, or then they're diagnosed with MS, or right. That kind of, people Hashimoto. have MS, lupus together. It seems well, like it's all the same thing because the yeah. immune system. It's you know the way I think of it is the immune system is just like it, it it's it's grasping at straws, mm -hmm. right? And so the attacking of normal tissue is just grasping at straws. So the approach that we use in naturopathic medicine is to help the person be healthier. Right. to restore normal balance and normal health mm -hmm. and therefore a normally reactive immune system. Mm -hmm. I saw someone recently who, um, without getting into a whole bunch of details, had an autoimmune problem, had consulted somebody for stem cell therapy in another state, and what he said to me, and he brought all his records with him, what he said to me is, I'm not going to do the stem cell therapy because obviously that guy didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, how do you come to that conclusion? And he said, well, in order to be a candidate for the stem cell therapy, he tested my immune system. 
my natural killer cell level activity and my CD4, CD8 cells. These are all components of the immune system. He tested these to see if I was a candidate for stem cell therapy. And every single parameter that was tested was below normal, right? Now he's been told he has an autoimmune disease and his immune system, he's got objective evidence that his immune system generally is compromised. And his conclusion was the doctor obviously doesn't know what he's doing because I have an autoimmune disease, which is an overactive immune system, so he believes, mm -hmm. and he's looking at objective evidence that that's not the case. Furthermore, he says, as my wife is my witness, I have a pretty good immune system. I haven't been sick in years. I don't get the flu. I don't get colds. Mm -hmm. She had the flu several times this year, and I didn't. So obviously I'm in better shape than she is. And the answer is exactly the opposite of what he's thinking. His immune system is so compromised, he can't get sick. Really? When you get sick, acutely ill, when you have the flu or a cold, your body's responding to a threat in order to deal with that or to correct it. If you tell me that you don't get sick, I know that you're really healthy or you're really sick. You can be too sick to be sick. Your immune system can be too compromised, so compromised, in fact, that it can't respond. And here's a perfect example. This guy's telling me in front of his wife, I don't get sick. He's really proud of himself. I don't get sick. I haven't been sick in years. And yet he has the evidence right in front of him that his immune system is under siege or compromised, right? Does he, does he have lupus and all those things? Yeah. Okay. So right, you know, exactly. I thought, well, there's the proof. Right? There's yeah. the proof, right? Yeah. And you see, the way the facts are being interpreted depends on how you understand the, 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 the paradigm or the worldview. Because facts are facts, but they don't interpret themselves. They have to be understood in a context. And so autoimmune disease, generally in this context, is an immune system that is inadequate to the task. It's so, can I just use the word tired or yeah. fried or yeah. compromised, right. that it doesn't know your thyroid from your not thyroid or your tissue from wow. your not tissue, right? Wow. So why do we have more That's lupus? And, and why do we why do we have more lupus? And why do we have more autoimmune diseases? Yeah, there's other diseases because here. Because we're in worse shape than we've ever been in terms of our overall health. We lead the world in chronic disease. We have more chronic disease. You know, the, the gift of allopathic medicine is more chronic disease because of what we said earlier. What, what is done with conventional medicine is the suppression of the symptoms, not the curing of the symptoms, not no. the curing of the patient, but the suppressing of the symptoms, the symptoms yeah. which allows the underlying problem to continue. Exactly. People always talk, they, people understand intuitively that most medications are covering up the symptoms. Most people will say, I don't want to take this because it's just masking the symptoms. Well, if you're masking the symptoms, you're also ignoring the underlying problem. Exactly. And we do that generation after generation, we get more and more ill and more and more chronically ill. Mm -hmm. And the, as a naturopathic doctor, the proof of that for me is that autoimmune disease is on the rise because it's a chronic illness. It's the situation that I've described. That's, so how would we address that? Yeah. The same way a naturopathic doctor addresses everything else. And I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be simplistic or smart about this, no. but the restoration of health. Using those nutrients and those interventions that restore health, increase vitality, bring us back to where we should be, that's our God-given right, you might say. Exactly. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's so simple. I mean, that's too simple. How yeah, that's that what simple? they would think. It's too simple, right? But when I'm teaching students about the philosophical differences between the two schools of medicine, which is the more simple? Working to restore health and finding out why that's not the case? Or simply giving you something to suppress the illness. I mean, conventional medicine has a lot of information. Gazillions of dollars of your tax money goes into propping up that system, subsidizing the system, paying for residents, paying for research. The information, there's, no, there's probably no other industry on the planet that has that much information and that much resources. But the approach is always the same. Right. Suppress the symptom. Exactly. Now, which is, more, which is the simpler of the two? Suppress the symptom or correct the underlying problem? 
Right. It looks complicated because, as one of the early writers in natural medicine said a hundred years ago, allopathic doctors will never cure disease because they don't understand what it is. Mm. Right? And that has led to the situation we're in now, which is more and more research, more and more information at the micro level to try to understand what's happening to this cell and why and so on and so forth, to try to intervene at that level. That's not the disease. That's the expression of the disease. That's the symptom of the disease. I understand you've had people on this show who talk about the other level in our world, a level of spirituality and right. emotions and so right. on. That's the level on which the problem is occurring. The physical is just a manifestation of that. That's right. You know, we're like one of my teachers said, we're the we're the bottom feeders here. This is, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that would be an interesting conversation to have with what's going on with autoimmune disease, with the self attacking the self. I mean, think of the implications of that right. on a spiritual level. On a spiritual level, exactly. On, a, on where does the self end and where does the other start? You talk about self-confidence and you talk about... Um, self-criticism uh, and doubt and so on and so forth. And that would be a good show. It would be. That would be an excellent show, so we're going to do it because I love excellent shows. <laughs> we are going to do that. We'll have some people here and we'll have a nice discussion on that. We've only got, got about a minute or two left. Um, so I guess people are going to either believe or not believe. They're going to do something about it. They're not going to do something about it. Um, that's the problem. They're so afraid. If they don't take that pill, it's all over, you know? Can I say something about belief? Sure. Because it's not about belief, but it challenges what people think they okay. understand, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people have been told all their lives that conventional medicine is scientific and they know what they're doing and so right. on. Well, the evidence suggests the contrary. We're the sickest nation on the planet, the most mm -hmm. chronic disease. I have a colleague who told me a story about the fact that she has a now one-year-old, one-year-old boy. When I talk to her infrequently, I inquire about the son, and she says, he's just the healthiest, I know I'm his mother and I'm really proud of him, but he's the healthiest kid I've ever seen. He's got sparkle in his eyes, he's got rosy cheeks, he's active, he's never been sick. She said, I thought he had something with his ear one time, but that passed. He's, he's, okay. he's just a year. Mm -hmm. He's starting to speak in short sentences. But she has another family member, her own age, who has a child the same age, who's sick all the time. In and out of the hospital, I mean, not in, back and forth to pediatrician, antibiotics all the time. And my point is, the family member can see this healthy kid and see this unhealthy kid and knows what she's doing but makes fun of her <laughs> for doing what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's like... I know. I have to interrupt you, and I hate to yeah. do that, but the time is up, and we have to give that contact information if you want people, people to get a hold of you. Get in touch with Dr. Sensenig. He's at Natural Health Associates in Hampton, Connecticut, www.naturalhealthconnecticut.com. Phone number is 203-230-2200. Okay, you want to make a change. And with us, if we don't finish this, you know that you can reach me at 203-627-7966. You know my email, whitebuffalo at comcast.net, and my website, www.rosemarychance.com. There's a ton of information there about all of this. So we wish you the best with your health. We hope this has been enlightening for you. We hope it will help you. And I want to thank you yeah, so much him. for coming. Charlie, and we're right. going to have him on many more times. We're going to discuss everything and we're going to do that show that you just talked about. Oh. Okay? Yep. Alright, everybody. want to say good night. Good night. Night, night.